and so hello everyone and it's already wednesday here in kyoto uh, but let's start and so today i would like to uh, take a look at what's happening inside the nma spectrometer when operated running pulse sequences and acquiring nma signals and i want to focus on our open source home-built NMO spectrometers we routinely use in our lab and show how we apply them in a conventional and unconventional NMO experiments. So that's the subject matter today. And first of all, I want to show you our own laboratory. So I hope the video is working. So now you are seeing white colored superconducting magnet. This is 32 years old seven Tesla magnet. And you can take a look at uh, some other magnets. Uh, this is 14 Tesla, 600 megahertz wide wall magnet. And let me walk through the room approaching another 9.4 Tesla magnet whiteboard and now solid state NMO experiment is work going on and on the screen you are seeing spectrum of adamantan carbon spectrum of adamantan and over there There are another seven Tesla and 4.7 Tesla magnet. So this is where we spend our daily NMA life in Kyoto. And all of them are equipped with uh, our home built NMA spectrometer that I myself tried to build some time ago. And I myself named it as an open core NMO spectrometer for some reasons. And board rings are available on the website freely. And there are some documents on this uh, GitHub repository. So for example, uh, this is our home-built NMO spectrometer hanging on a wall dedicated for our 14 Tesla magnet. And this is another one for 9.4 Tesla magnet. Uh, all of them are triply uh, uh, equipped with triple, uh, three RF channels for up to triple resonance experiments, mainly solid state NMO. And this is a seven Tesla NMO system and another seven Tesla, quite similar. And this is 4.7 Tesla. And we have somewhat special cryogen free field variable magnets dedicated for field swept or field variable experiment. And we, for this magnet, we have another one spectrometer hanging on the wall here. And finally, uh, we happen to have a permanent one Tesla magnet, mainly used for uh, NMR toy. So very roughly speaking, NMR system is composed of firstly, magnet and probe, RF components and spectrometer. And I think there are already very, very nice lectures in about probes in this global animal series. So I would like to focus on something else, namely the spectrometer. And again, very roughly speaking, spectrometer is composed of a transmitter and receiver. So they are what I'm going to focus on today. So now I would like to start with a transmitter and the function of transmitter is to um, generate a 
waveform with an arbitrary frequency, phase, amplitude, and pulse modulation according to what we want to apply to the spin system that we deal with. So, and, and the shape of the pulse and phase and uh, frequency may be dynamically changed to implement some shaped pulse. So we need uh, some frequency source and phase shifting capability, amplitude modulation and pulse modulation. And importantly, uh, in regarding the phase of the RF signal, um, I mean, uh, it's important to remember that the phase is not the absolute phase that matters, rather the phase of the output with respect to the input reference signal is important for the manipulation of spin with uh, intended phase. And for the receiver part, I will come back to this point later, but very uh, roughly speaking, and receiver is a kind of converter of an NMR, NMR signal from the laboratory to the rotating frame representation by means of quadrature demodulator. Yeah, I will talk, I'll come back to this point later. So now, uh, first of all, we need some frequency source in the spectrometer. There are various ways, but these days it is very convenient to generate sinusoidal waveform by means of direct digital synthesis for, for brevity DDS. And this is very convenient and simple for RF signal generation. And these days, microwave may be uh, generated using this uh, strategy. Here we can mentally imagine a wheel and we imagine, let's imagine that we are moving on a circumference this wheel at a constant rate. And let's again imagine that uh, we need the vertical coordinates as a function of the time, then it automatically gives you a sinusoidal wave. In this example, um, we are doing it in a discrete, discrete steps. In this example, uh, we uh, drive this wheel, we are going moving around the wheel at a rate of 160 megahertz, 45 degrees on each step. So eight step corresponds to one whole rotation. It's generating 20 megahertz fundamental signal. But in addition, we have some harmonics. In this example, we have 20 megahertz fundamental and harmonics at 140, 180, 300, 340, and so on. In our case, um, we implement this kind of DDS using a um, digital to analog converter AD9740 from analog devices. And the signal is coming from uh, FGA. And we implement very uh, simple. Uh, it's lengthy, but simple. It's just a kind of uh, memory carrying a table of sinusoidal waveform. So inside FPGA, um, according to the clock, we are moving the address and each address has an output corresponding to some point of the sinusoidal wave. So all we need to do is just to jump the address one after another by 40, uh, corresponding to 45 degree step. When we want to change the phase of the signal, we just shift the overall phase of this wave. So it's just a matter of shifting slightly um, the address uh, that we indicate on the memory. In this way, we can generate a nice waveform as demonstrated on this oscilloscope display. 
And we are interested in up to triple resonance experiments. Uh, that's why we implemented three separate DDS, identical DDS, but working independently on this board and three separate phase accumulator and phase amplitude conversion table inside a single chip of FPGA driven by a clock at 160 megahertz so that we have three separate output of direct digital synthesized waveform here. So we can change freely the phase of the output. In this example, uh, the blue one has a fixed phase. So it's just continuous oscillation while we intentionally shifted the phase of the other channel shown in the yellow lines. But the time scale is intentionally elongated to an order of seconds. Uh, usually for NM experiments, yeah, you need to do it uh, on the order of uh, microseconds or even shorter. Yeah, it's, you can do it with our spectrometer. The time resolution is around uh, highest time, shortest time resolution around six nanoseconds. So for most animal purposes, it works. And as I mentioned, we have several Fourier components. And for some reasons, we are interested in 180 megahertz component alone. So we want to discard all the other Fourier components. And that's why we uh, designed a bandpass filter in such a way that we have a stop rejection band exactly at 140 and 300 megahertz, like this. And after some uh, try and error, and uh, we found that the filter, whole handmade filter works quite nice, passing 180 megahertz alone, rejecting others. So the original output had spect uh, power spectrum uh, as displayed here. Uh, so the fundamental corresponds to 20 megahertz, 140, 180, and so on. And we are only interested in 180 components here. And after passing the signal through the filter, we successfully obtained a nice uh, monotonic waveform as demonstrated here. Of course, the vertical scale is a bit different, but it's just a matter of amplifying it. And we have another uh, waveform source uh, for the individual three RF channels. So we have three boards, identical boards on a single spectrometer, and it is implemented uh, using a DDS dedicated LSI AD98558 from also from analog devices. It is very, very useful. It is driven by a one gigahertz clock, and you can just send a phase tuning word through this port. Then you get the desired waveform at a desired frequency. So this photo shows the way that the board is connected to the frequency tuning world from Pulse Programmer implemented inside an FPGA, the same one, and one gigahertz in clock input ports. And we have, for, for each board, we have two, a pair of equivalent outputs. This is required because we need to send it to the transmitter as well as to the receiver as a reference signal. And very roughly speaking, the DDS, for DDS, the maximum output frequency is around uh, 0 .0 0.4 times the clock frequency. So we examined it, but up to 420 megahertz, uh, it's the output is fine. And at higher frequencies, we have some spurious signal 
I mean, the, the orange lines appear simultaneously when we try to output, for example, for, for I don't know, I, I forgot, for 50 megahertz or for 8 megahertz, 480 megahertz and so on. We have uh, quite uh, non-negligible um, spurious components. This may also be uh, removed by another future, but I don't know. So now that we have frequency sources with phase shifting capability, we need to modulate the amplitude and apply pulse modulation to make pulse RF pulse with an arbitrary frequency, phase, and amplitude. So for this purpose, we implemented a transmitter. Uh, this is a board. This shows a board design, and we have several inputs and outputs. So the 180 megahertz phase tunable signal comes here, while the other frequency tunable uh, sinusoidal wave comes here on this port, and it is mixed on the on the active mixer. And the mixed signal is passed through an RF filter to get the desired Fourier components. And then it is amplitude modulated using an amplitude, um, using a analog multiplier. And finally, using the RF, RF switch, the pulse modulation is performed. This is the idea. So again, uh, so the, we have two input sources for the individual channel, and one is a phase tunable uh, frequency fixed signal at 180 megahertz, while the other is a frequency tunable uh, signal from uh, AD 9858. And the mixed signal is passed through an RF filter, and amplitude profile is for the amplitude modulation, we have another um, analog digital to analog converter on the board here. So this output comes to this port so that you can change the amplitude profile to uh, an, any shape you want. And we have an, a TTL some TTL ports, so one of them is used for gating the RF switch to perform pulse modulation. So this is actual. This shows an actual photo showing the complete um, and assembled transmitter. It works quite nice. This figure shows a schematic view of the transmitter. So this uh, red uh, shape, polygon shape, describes the schematic of the transmitter board. So we have a mixer receiving two frequency sources, and then uh, which is the output is passed through a bandpass filter and amplitude modulation and phase, uh, pulse modulation is performed. So in this way, we can implement RF pulse with any shape, I mean, any amplitude and phase and frequency. So let me show you some examples of uh, a relatively complicated uh, pulse sequence. One example is uh, what we call double mutation or donut. Uh, this is an analog to a physical double rotation, DOR, but it is implemented in the spin space. So the corresponding propagator or time evolution operator uh, looks like this. So we uh, perform mutation simultaneously around two separate axes. 
Now the target propagator is relatively simple, but from this propagator, we can derive the Hamiltonian, corresponding Hamiltonian. Then we can extract the required profile of the amplitude, phase, and frequency. And the frequency can be implemented through the phase modulation. It's up to you. But the profile is relatively complicated, but um, we could implement it without any difficulty. So the, of course, this can be done in um, any modern NMR spectrometer, but it's it works also on a handmade spectrometer as well. Uh, this shows some example of. Uh, the resultant double mutation. Uh, I mean, this is a kind of mutation spectrum obtained with a, with a liquid proton with double mutation with uh, various combinations of the first and second mutations. So uh, what we can obtain is the trajectory on the XY plane, transverse plane and this blue line corresponds to a three-dimensional trajectory of the magnetization obtained by solving numerically the block equations. And on the, the red curve corresponds to its projection onto the XY plane. And experimental results uh, were nice, I have to say. And let me switch to some examples that we need to sweep or modulate the frequency. In this example, uh, the, it's a variant of cross polarization, but instead of applying pi half pulse followed by spin lock pulse, in this case, we apply adiabatic sweep from far off resonance to the on resonance on the proton channel so that the proton magnetization, which is initially along the z-axis, is locked and adiabatically swept from far off resonance toward on resonance. And to implement it, we need some uh, sweep of the frequency over 100 or 200 kilohertz, and it worked. And on the right, we demonstrate a uh, somewhat obsolete nowadays uh, frequency switched the Goldberg experiment. Nowadays, uh, ultra high speed MAS is so popular that uh, quite a few people would be interested in it, but uh, it requires jump of the frequency one after another, and it worked. And another interesting demonstration of frequency sweep is a vector network analyzer. I mean, NMR spectrometer also works for a vector network analyzer. We usually use to tune the probe. I mean, the sequence is quite simple. Power sequence for the network analysis like this, we just switch on a transmitter gate and frequency is swept over a range of your interest. And simultaneously, you open the receiver gate and acquire the signal. And the cable connection looks like this. The transmitter output is connected to a probe and its reflection is fed back, fed back to a receiver. And this way, uh, we could obtain a dip. Or if you plot the in-phase and quadrilateral in a parametrical way, we can polar plot the in-phase and quadrilateral or the real and imaginary component in, on a plane so that we can um, measure the, something like a um, magnitude mode and vector mode, which corresponds to the Smith chart representation on the usual vector network analyzer. And in this case, so sweep, frequency sweep works quite well. So that's it for the transmitter. And let's now switch to the receiver. So I'm showing this slide again. The function of the receiver is to convert the 
the animal signal usually in the laboratory frame into the rotating frame. Yeah, from theoretical viewpoint in NMR, it's quite usual to think about spin dynamics in the rotating frame of reference while we ourselves are living in a laboratory frame. We don't rotate at some 100 megahertz. How does it work? Because receiver can do it for us. I mean, the receiver receives the signal, FID, as well as the reference signal from the transmitter or the shared by the uh, transmitter. And the original NMO signal is divided into two and the reference signal is also divided into two, but one of which is phase shifted by 90 degrees. And they are mixed. By mix, I mean literally mix, just a mathematical multiplication of the sine waves. And according to the psi multiplication rule, we have some other frequency components corresponding to the sum or difference of two input frequencies. And usually we uh, let one of them pass through. And then finally, digital and store the in phase as an in phase and a quadrature components of the signal. In this way, the receiver can transform the laboratory frame signal into the rotating frame for us. So one input results in two outputs. And it's fun to build a straightforward version of this quadrature demodulator using uh, discrete components. This is a photo of an example. We have a pair of splitters, RF splitters, and a pair of mixers and filters. So here we have a reference signal divided into two, and also RF signal, I mean the NMO signal, is divided into two. And they are mixed together using it in a mixer. And only one Fourier component is filtered out to get in phase and quadrature components. So one interesting difference between these two channels is the length. Except for this cable length, the device looks completely symmetric. But this is important. I made it caref carefully to make sure that the difference of the phase is just uh, differs by uh, um, quarter wavelengths. So the length depends on the frequency. Uh, in this case, the intermediate frequency or the reference frequency is 180 megahertz. So the length looks like this. And this is quite straightforward and uh, looks a bit obsolete, but uh, it's a bit of fun as a toy. And um, because, yeah, this is straightforward implementation of in phase and quadrature uh, decomposition. And you can just amplify this amp uh, the output and play a sound. And I'm not really sure if you can hear the sound of an FID because just before we tested the sound of this Zoom meeting, but it did, didn't work. Now I'm hearing, I hear the sound of an FID. It's nice, uh, nice sounds. That's very unfortunately you cannot hear. This is another example. We just shifted slightly the reference frequency to change the tone of the sound. So this kind of quadrilateral demodulator is very uh, useful and fun to learn how you can convert 
the RF signal in, into the audio regime. But in our case of an open core NMR spectrometer, we have a somewhat different receiver board as the size is 40 by 40 millimeters, uh, quite compact. And we have, basically we have just a mixer. And this AD8343 is very useful because we also can implement RF gate by sending logic signal, we can just shut out the input. So this can work, serve for an R receiver gate as well. Okay, anyway, the FID, let's suppose FID at a frequency of F coming from the input ports here. And we have a reference signal corresponding with a frequency of F plus or F minus 180 megahertz. Then we have 180 megahertz or F plus third, third uh, 360 megahertz and so on. We just need a 180 megahertz component using a bump pass filter. And the signal is um, analog to digital converted. And finally, digital signal processing is performed inside in the FPGA. So this small black square is actually the AD converter, AD9245. And it's a 14-bit AD converter working at a rate of 80 mega sampling per second. And immediately after it is digitally converted, the signal, digital signal, it's sent to the FPGA for digital signal processing. And now you may wonder, is it all right to receive 180 megahertz signal with a clock rate of just 80 megahertz, which is much lower? So here comes the interesting uh, super naked sampling. So to understand it, let's imagine what's happening when we uh, digitize signal. I mean, uh, let's suppose we uh, acquire a signal at a sampling rate of 80 megahertz. Usually the Nike zone is as narrow as half this frequency. I mean, the, the width is just 40 megahertz. So we usually see a much higher Fourier component folded back and the ADS into view. So we can, again, mentally imagine a bellows fold paper or accordion paper and see through it. So this is um, what we observe. This is inescapable when we uh, digitize the signal, digitally sample the signal. I mean, all three components fold into view. So what we usually do is to pass the signal through a low pass filter before analog to digital conversion. Let's suppose we have a 40 megahertz low pass filter. Then all other higher free components are shut out. So although even though we are seeing through this bellows for the paper, uh, we apparently see only this first Nikist zone. So the fundamental limitation is not the frequency, but the range of the window. So all we need to do is just to swap this low pass filter by a band pass filter. Let's say we have a band pass filter and um, passing signal um, in the range of 180 plus minus 20 megahertz, then we can just select this fifth nightest zone. And when we see through the bellows for the paper, we can only get the three components on uh, inside this region of interest. That's the trick.
And previously, I showed you how a quadrature demodulation works using an analog mixer and filter. But in our case, we implement it in a digital way. So mathematically, it's simple because mixer literally mix the signal, just multiplication, mathematical multiplication of sine waves. So we can do it even in a digital manner, and we do it. In particular, um, the combination of 80 megahertz and 180 megahertz intermediate frequency is some magic number because at this sampling rate, um, yeah, yeah, we need to multiply sine and cosine to extract in phase and quadrature components. But at this particular timing, the sine and cosine takes the values of only one, zero, or minus one. So the multiplication, complicated multiplication of a com uh, floating point number is simply replaced by addition or subtraction. So in this relatively simple way, we can uh, decompose the original signal into real and imaginary or in-phase and quadrature components. And this uh, strategy of digital quadrature demodulation works quite well, nice. So let's demonstrate quadrature demonstration uh, using one Tesla magnet. There, yeah, this is some demonstration of one Tesla magnet uh, enema of uh, liquid water. Just repeat scanning at a rate of uh, some 0 0.5 seconds. And now we just parametrically plot in phase and quadrilateral components. So we see nice spiral shape. We are seeing the same entity, but represented in a different way. We have real and imaginary or in phase and quadrature components, usually plotted on the, with the horizontal axis being the time. But we can also plot the parametrically polar plot. Yeah, this is fun because this directory represents the way that the nuclear magnetization persisting in the rotating frame, even though we can only see the projection onto the XY plane. And the post digitization phase rotation is straightforward. For beginners, it's very difficult to imagine what do you mean by phase rotation, but in the polar plot, what is done by phase rotation is obvious, I hope. And if you accumulate the signal, this spiral shape is expanding and signal is accumulated. It's obvious, but it's sometimes fun to see this movie. Okay, let's stop and move on. So this polar plot is in particular interesting if you observe rotational echo in magic and spinning experiments. Usually you do it just to adjust the magic angle from KBR, and usually you do it on exactly on resonance. Yeah, of course it works. And if you slightly make the resonance off the reference and then you polar plot, then the rotational echo draw a very nice profile depending on the resonance offset and spinning frequency. Some people ask me what's the point, mm, but all I can reply is it's fun. That's it. So now let me summarize the part one. 
we have seen how the transmitter and the receiver work. And of course, we are focusing on open core NMO spectrometer and for other platforms, the way that they implement is a bit different. But nevertheless, the point is the, the function of the transmitter and receiver. I mean, the transmitter generates our signals with arbitrary modulation according to what you want to do to the spin system that you are dealing with. And the receiver transforms the nuclear induction signal into the rotating frame representation. And at this point, do you have any questions? I mean, to the audience? Okay, so, uh, thank you very much, uh, Takeda. Just uh, to say to the audience that there's a, a question and answer um, panel where you, where you should be able to, to post your questions and then I can see them um, and ask them. And actually, we already have one question. <laughs> From, uh, uh, Charlotte Bokele. Um, I can I can read it to you, Takeda. Okay. What is the interface used with this system? And uh, uh, I guess uh, on the computer. And then can the spectrometer handle trigger signals in the NMR sequence? For example, to simply launch the sequence once the spectrometer receives a trigger in signal. Yes, the first question. Uh, interface is a uh, home-built one. I mean, the interface. Uh, yeah, interface is too specific to the platform. So um, it's not, it's important from practical viewpoint, but it's uh, not fundamental. So I intentionally avoided discussing the interface, but uh, all are homemade. And for the second question, yes, we can output or receive the trigger signal for synchronization with other devices outside. Yes. Then by Walt Masevsky, commercial spectrometers have extensive RF shielding, but your spectrometer board is mounted on the wall. Is RF shielding less important than we think? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, it depends on the environment that you use. Yeah, for example, yeah, yeah, it's, if you are not lucky enough that you may be working in a very very noisy environment so in this case you may want to do something to shield the system whereas in some good places the amazing place is a mr room in a hospital i found the environment so silent in such a case, you don't have to shield the system at all. In uh, my maybe, personal opinion. Maybe a follow-up question, because I did see it. Is the low noise amplifier in your case, is that actually on the board or is it closer to the to the spectrometer? Well, low noise amplifier is outside the scope of the spectrometer. Uh, so uh, you need to uh, use a good low noise amplifier because it's almost extensively determines the overall signal to noise, noise ratio for a given uh, magnetic field and uh, probe quality. So I guess once the signal is strong enough, it, the, also the RF noise from outside is less important, I guess. Mm. So, okay. Uh, then yeah. another question by Giram Baumgarten. Dear Professor Takeda, thank you for your talk. Are your transmitter and receiver exact enough to implement FID accumulation of weak signals? I think so, yes. Okay, I guess that's a, that's a good answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's another question, I guess, is the same as before. NMR spectrometers are open boards hanging on the wall. Is shielding important? And then the temperature control, I guess, uh, do you have a temperature control of the of the board, I guess? Is the uh, temperature control, no, but uh, the temperature affects uh, the clock of our system. And on our board, we are using relatively good clock source operating at 10 megahertz from which we make another uh, frequency like 160 or 1 gigahertz and so on. And the quality of the clock is important. And the clock is uh, oven controlled. So it's already very hot. So I haven't tried to, yeah, on purpose, deliberately heat up or cool down the 
crystal clock, but it may affect the overall performance or stability or the phase noise and the accurate time or and so on. So a question by someone named Selina. What was the most difficult part to design? Well, everything was uh, difficult. Um, I mean, um, yeah, indeed, I myself started this project uh, some 20 years ago from scratch. So uh, started with part by part and the most difficult part is integration of the system into one that really works. Um, there's still time for more questions, but if there's none from the audience, then uh, I might have uh, have one. So uh, two actually. So is there actually something like an absolute signal to noise standard uh, in, in, in NMR that people use that you can say, well, your system is actually as good as as another one or well that's very difficult question so i don't have a good answer and yeah again the spectrometer it's rather than spectrometer itself the yeah. it's the probe and low noise amplifier in particular yeah. the first stage low noise amplifier that determines the overall signal to noise ratio okay. so yeah i'm interested in yeah uh, um, characterizing the noise performance in terms of some um, power spectrum of the noise. But it's a bit difficult. Yeah. So we are just procrastinating it. Okay. And uh, another question from the audience. What do you do about the temperature drifting on your spectrometers? Because the variation of the temperature makes the frequency of the FAD change as well. Is that one Tesla spectrometer stabilized for temperature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the one Tesla magnet, the yeah, magnetic field drift if you change the temperature. And for the superconducting magnet, it doesn't matter at all. And I mean, the frequency of the spectrometer is stable enough. Yeah. Yeah, I have more slides. Uh, may I continue uh, yeah, after? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 I, okay. I can I can show you some examples. Yeah. Okay. okay I, we we have some other questions. Um, <laughs> yes. So let's let's <laughs> let's have one more question and then, uh, then yeah, we yeah. can go. So Axel Gansmüller, is it possible to run NQR experiments below six megahertz? Yeah, since we do. Usually, we do. Okay. Since usually there's a lot of RF interference. Okay, but you do them. Okay. Yeah, we do it. Well, then uh, let's let's pause the questions for here. You can still type that in the question and answers. Um, but uh, yeah, you can uh, you can go on. Okay, thank you. So uh, let me finish the part one and move on to the second part. Oh, this is just for fun, and we can implement uh, the expand transmitter and receiver. And this is, I would I just wanted to show it. So this is some something outside the scope, and. We want to the part two a little more about our spectrometers. I mean, yeah, they are the photograph. This is they are boards, and some more detailed uh, specifications are we have three channels, RF channels per spectrometer, and yeah, amplitude and phase and frequency can be modulated. And operating frequency is at this moment up to 600 megahertz without any optional frequency source. We can up convert it. And the minimal pulse width is 20 nano, 25 nanoseconds. And the minimum step 6.25 nanoseconds. And the sampling rate is 80 megahertz. And digital quadrature demodulation is, is implemented. And importantly, all digital parts or to be honest, nearly all parts of the digital part of the spectrometer is implemented inside a single single chip of the FPGA. So the specification uh, and schematics looks like this. The orange part corresponding to a single chip of FPGA inside which we have implemented three parallel independent pulse programmer 
and three different uh, separate direct digital synthesizer and the receiver uh, composed of uh, capable of digital quadrature demodulation, digital filtration, and so on. And we also implemented interface. And this is frequently frequently asked questions. Yeah, can you sell it? Can I buy it? I'm so sorry to say uh, no. I mean, I myself don't do any business. I want to do research work. So um, collaboration is welcome, but I cannot sell and support it. But the design is open to public, so in principle, you can build it by yourself. And the second most asked, frequently asked question is the cost. Well, it's difficult to answer, but uh, roughly speaking, several thousand euros for the parts. But uh, uh, maybe patience and time and effort maybe uh, may cost quite a lot. So let me show you some examples of using this open core NMR spectrometer, conventional and unconventional one. So, um, so every day we use the spectrometer, so we collect a lot of data, but uh, I chose some sensitivity demanding experiments here, like microcore experiments with very, very tiny amount of biological sample and lithium-6 exchange NMO and in-situ lithium-7 of NMO of battery and so on. And you may wonder the resolution. So uh, we once tried to do some liquid state NMO by setting up a commercial liquid uh, system and gently swapped the commercial spectrometer with the spect open core spectrometer with a common sample and common probe and common preamplifier and so on. So the stability looks nice. And we do some applications like uh, gas kinetics, and NQR experiment, and so on. That's it for the conventional one. And yeah, I'd like to focus on some unconventional experiments because this is the most interesting part because we can modify uh, the hardware according to our ideas. So uh, one application is MRI. Uh, this may be conventional, but uh, I'm not really sure if the normal commercial spectrometer can implement MR experiments. In our case, uh, MR experiments require only a single RF channel. So the amplitude control of the other channel are used, utilized for gradient waveform generator. And NMR, MR experiments were successful. And at some point, we got interested in modulating the receiver gain dynamically during acquisition of an, of an NMR signal. This may be in particular useful if you deal with a mixture of a relatively large sample and small sample. And in case if the small sample have longer T2, then the large signal components decays fast, while the other long living components is so uh, the gain is limited. In this case, we can increase the receiver gain as the FID decays. So we can gain the receiver, uh, we can increase the receiver gain without uh, causing saturation of the receiver. And afterwards, we can uh, perform mathematically apodization. In this way, we could enhance a little, just a little, the small component. And when we want simultaneous acquisition of multiple channels, uh, 
yeah, in our spectrometer, we have only a single receiver channel. But if you sim want to simultaneously acquire, uh, uh, for example, carbon and nitrogen signal simultaneously, then a, two, two, a pair of separate spectrometer can synchronize with each other using triggers. Then we could obtain nice signal from carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 simultaneously. And we happen to have a field variable magnet, so we could automatically sweep the magnetic field. And by fixing the frequency and by gradually increasing the signal, the first signal you get is the signal from protons. If the sample contains protons, then next you can access fluorine 19 if the sample contains fluorine 19 and so on. In this way, we can observe multiple nuclei in a single run, a single array experiment. And if you are interested in higher frequency, uh, you can just up convert the signal. Um, in this case, we require some other frequency source. In our case, we have another uh, expand oscillator and the open core NMO output is mixed together to make an mic a microwave pulse with any arbitrary and amplitude phase and frequency modulation. And then down convert and then signal is fed back to the spectrometer again. In this way, we could observe electron spin echo train on open core NMO. But the limitation is time resolution. As I said, the time resolution is some several nanoseconds, which may not be short enough for many practical EPR applications. So this is just a demonstration of gamma irradiated quartz, which have exceptionally long T2. And traditional continuous wave experiments, it's straightforward if you modify the hardware. And you can customize the system according to what you want to do. And one Tesla magnet can be used to uh, make a bookshelf NMO system or even MRI system with homemade gradient driver and very tiny probe equipped with a three-channel gradient uh, coil. But the sample space is so limited, so we could only measure MRI of very tiny sample. And nowadays, the spectrometer is used as a part of hyperpolarizing system in our collaborators. And the spectrometer happens to be so tiny, so we can carry it to some other place, like a hospital. Yeah, that's why I know that the MI room in a hospital, it's so silent. Because it was amazing that the spectrometer is picking up so small noise. And we can bring your one Tesla magnet together with a spectrometer to a classroom or to your home and so on. And the final example is uh, our recent work on what we call electromechano optical animal experiments. Here, uh, we have an LC circuit for NMO signal detection. This is usual, but uh, what is unusual is the capacitor used in the elect in LC circuit. Here we have a uh, elastic um, thin film oscillator uh, working as an electrode and the optical mirror. So the nuclear induction causes charge between the electrodes, in turn causing the Coulomb attraction between them, affecting the vibration of this membrane oscillator, which is in turn read out by uh, optical means. 
Uh, so I'm speak, skipping all the details, but uh, recently uh, we made something like this. I mean, the, this is a silicon nitride membrane supported by a silicon frame, five millimeter by five millimeter. The membrane is just one millimeter, one millimeter, on which we vacuum deposit an aluminum layer serving for the capacitor electrode and an optical mirror. And this is gently put inside a homemade vacuum chamber. We need a vacuum to avoid the damping of the oscillation of the membrane. And we designed a fabric pedal optical cavity and the special probe shown here. And the capacitor is connected to a coil. So here we modified, heavily modified our spectrometer for the demonstration of this EMO NMO experiments. For the upper parts, there's nothing special. We have uh, simply doubly, uh, double resonance equipment, I mean, dual transmitter. But the membrane characteristic frequency is just on the order of 10, 100 kilohertz, which differs quite a lot from the Lama frequency of interest, which is several tens of megahertz. That's why we need to apply to the system a drive signal corresponding to either the sum or the difference between this membrane oscillation frequency and frequency of interest. For this purpose, we modify the one transmitter of a spectrometer to apply the drive signal. In addition, we mixed uh, the carrier signal with the carbon uh, reference frequency to make a frequency source of coherent quadrature demodulation. How it does it work? The laser beam is fed into an optical fiber and through a collimator inside a magnet onto the membrane sitting inside a vacuum chamber. And a nuclear induction signal is causing the Coulomb force, so affecting the vibration and light reflected back from the optical cavity carries this information and come back through the optical fiber again, which is finally photo detected, and then processed with this quadrature demodulator. So vertical optical alignment was a bit tough, but my former student Yusuke Tominaga did a very good job on it. So he's now gently, carefully inserting this optically aligned system into the magnet and do EMO NM. So this is a scene of an experiment. We have a laser and a photo detector on an optical bed and we have an optical fiber going through inside the magnet and the reflection is detected with photo detector. And for vacuum evacuation by chamber, we have vacuum evacuation system here. And let me magnify the optical bed. So we have a laser source and we have a beam splitter here to split the beam into two. One is used for reference while the other is sent to the membrane sitting inside the vacuum chamber, again, in turn, inside the superconducting magnet. And the light reflected back is being split into the photo detector. And these two uh, photo detector uh, give you a differential signal. And this uh, yellow peak corresponded to a successfully it indicates the su successful conversion of RF signal to light. Yeah, in this way, we somehow implemented EMO NMO. 
combined with inept sequence. So this is an EM or NMO signal of carbon-13 from liquid benzene. There's a lot of more story, but uh, this is somewhat outside the scope of today. So uh, I will stop here, here. Um, so now let me uh, finish the part two uh, with some comments. Um, that is, we have seen how the transmitter and the receiver of an NMR, NMR spectrometer work. And uh, we realize we are not usual, but we chose our own way of building NMR spectrometer instead of purchasing it and building from scratch. Um, honestly, it's tough and fun. But we are, nevertheless, we are happy about that because we can modify the hardware and software quickly and flexibly according to the ideas that come to our mind. And this work was supported by a lot of people. In particular, in my student days, I was very lucky uh, to have an opportunity of a home-built animal spectrometer uh, developed by Professor Ta uh, Takehiko Tera and, and Kiyonori Takegoshi. And uh, yeah, I had no choice but to use it, which uh, get out of order so frequently. So I have no choice but to uh, repair by myself. So this was a very nice opportunity to learn how an NMR spectrometer works. So at some point, I was motivated to build my own spectrometer based on their ideas, but using the latest available technologies like digital signal processing and FPGA and so on. And the current lab member and for, former lab members uh, extensively uh, used the spectrometer and uh, occasionally report some uh, problems and bugs. Indeed, I got a report from my students today uh, reporting bugs. So I have to repair or fix the bug tomorrow in the morning. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to reply. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Takeda, um, for, this, for this nice overview. Um, I guess there's uh, some more time uh, for questions now. So um, this was still from before by Casper uh, Hansen. Did you CNC the PCBs in-house or have a company produce them for you? Well, at first we did uh, using our own circuit board plotter. And this is very nice because uh, we can make it very quickly but at some point, uh, we got interested in making multi-layered board. Indeed, uh, recently we designed four-layer or six-layer boards, which is not possible with our CNC circuit board plotter. That's why we uh, just design and order the manuf board manufacturer. Then uh, another question by Maud Musevsky. Have you attempted to build your own NMR probes? Yeah, we do. We do. Yeah. But um, we, I, I just choose not to talk about the probe, uh, which is very interesting. But uh, yeah, I realized there is already a very nice lecture on the probe. That's why um, I avoided, skipped the probe part. Another question by Guillaume Baumgarten. Have you designed your own shimming system and the gradient modules for MRI? Was that more difficult than designing the receiver and transmitter parts of the spectrometer? Uh, yes, we design our own. Uh, not shimming, but uh, gradient coils. Yeah, we design and build. Okay. Yeah, it's just a matter of... Yeah, drawing a pattern and calculate the profile of the field gradient using beyond server law and then yeah improve design and calculate the field profile and again and again 
uh, another question by Charlotte. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Do you have some applications of EMO NMR? I think you mentioned moisture detection in an organic sample. What is the interest compared to RF detection? Well, uh, for the EMO NMR, yeah, currently we are struggling, struggling to, yeah, exceeding the performance of the conventional electrical detection. So uh, that's what we are aiming at right now. But EMO NMR has the capability of cooling the system. I mean, uh, I didn't talk about it, but we can uh, cool the thermal vibration of brownian motion of membrane by means of some trick without lowering the physical temperature. So this is a uh, known as the mode cooling. So this is very interesting. We want to pursue from now on. And uh, the moisture detection in an organic sample. Yeah, that, that's a completely um, different topic uh, that we work on uh, using porous. Yeah, we are also interested in porous material and kinex kinetics of gas absorbed and dissolved inside. So uh, it's not directly related to uh, to our hardware development. It's uh, one um, up activity toward application of NMR spectroscopy. Could you actually also excite with the EMO NMR somehow? Like, could you induce a current in the, in the coil by, I don't know, by shining light and modulating the light or something like this? Well, uh, what do you mean? Um, for EMO NMR, uh, do you... Well, do the reverse. You... I, now you detect, but I guess you technically you could also somehow generate the voltage in the coil by, by something like this, or... Mm. I guess not. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's still some, if you have another... Oh, there is another question coming, so I guess... <laughs> could Ooh. you develop a bit more why you would like to employ the super super, super sampling for the fifth Nyquist frequency band? Does it give you useful information? Yeah, because otherwise we need to work on 20 megahertz intermediate frequency, which is rather low, which means that uh, we have spurious Fourier components every 20 megahertz. So the yeah Fourier component that we need to remove, it's so crowded. So we are interested in going up the frequent intermediate frequency, but still we have a limited sampling rate of our AD converter. That's the reason. 